the last lecture of APC. So hopefully I'll um, be able to keep you guys awake during this time. But thank you for being here. You're the last uh, and the, the faithful here. Um, so we're going to talk today about diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, um, what I not affectionately call the unholy trinity. Um, so these are three things that I'm constantly battling in my clinic and hoping to, to show you some data behind what these th how these are um, linked together and how we might treat them um, as uh, one disorder. Nothing disclosed, unfortunately. Uh, some objectives there. And I like to always start off with a case. Uh, so Mr. H, a 59-year-old Caucasian male with a history of hypertension, diabetes, type 2, dyslipidemia, and chronic low back pain. He presents to the ED with chest pain and shortness of breath. An EKG shows ST elevation in the lateral leads, and he was taken to the cath lab where he underwent PCI, and our team has been asked to evaluate his diabetes regimen, which I will tell you, this is not an uncommon event in the hospital, so we see this all the time. So further history, um, he's had diabetes for about 12 years with reported complications of retinopathy and requiring laser photocoagulation as well as diabetic neuropathy. He's being treated with metformin, 850 milligrams TID, as well as Lantus, 60 units every day. Uh, he's had back pain um, due to a job accident 14 years ago, and so he's been inactive and he's progressively gained weight over that time. He currently weighs 273 pounds, and his weight before his injury was 198. Uh, 25 pounds has he specifically occurred over the last 18 months when he's become even less active than he is now. So just a few labs we can see here. Um, we have a little bit of elevation as AST, ALT. His hemoglobin A1C is 9.8, and otherwise fairly unremarkable. So let me just ask anybody, has anybody seen this patient before in their clinic or in, okay, I'm not alone. So let's just start off with obesity as our first circle here. Um, because really, obesity is really what triggers the majority of what we're going to be talking about today. And when I talk about diabetes today, diabetes type 2 is what I'm going to be referencing. I'm not really talking about type 1 diabetes at this time. Um, so whenever I say diabetes mellitus, I'm generally referring to type 2. So as we can see here, uh, obesity throughout our country is continuing to rise. You can see all the way back from 1999, all the way up to the present. Um, obesity and severe obesity are significantly increasing in our country. What are, this, what are these phenomena? Why are they increasing? Well, we know these things, right? So we get our free diabetes with the purchase of large Coke. We beat our diabetes with a Frosty. And a heart attack never looks so delicious in an In-N-Out burger, right? So um, all of these things contribute to it. In addition, inactivity, right? So I, I like this one because heaven forbid you should actually get any activity before you actually get into the gym. Right, so you take the escalator here, and then, of course, we have some New Year's resolution up there. But there's actually, we, we know that a, over a third of people um, with diabetes are um, the, defined as physically inactive, which means less than 10 minutes per week. Um, and so this is a very, you know, just 10 minutes, right, um, of moderate or vigorous um, on the job, um, leisure time or transportation, any kind of um, exercise. So less than 10 minutes per week, right, and not even 38% um, are able to make that. And we can break it down further into um, sex. We can see about the same between men and women, and women in total. Um, so about across the board here, um, ages and sex, about 40%. So this is very alarming. If we look and we break it down into um, across the country, we can see a lot of yellow here out in the West, but I'll dispel some of those myths in a second. Colorado seems to be pretty good, but it's cold there, right? So. Um, Maybe not too many people are living there. There's colder places um, out here. And I wish I would have actually put in the 2016 version of this because there is quite a few states. At least five states were added to this in 2018 in the red or severe greater than 35% obesity. So you can see as you move out west, maybe you're more active. Who knows? Um, but a little bit less obesity as um, in the Midwest especially. So as we move on, obesity, and then um, many times this leads to type 2 diabetes, and associated with that are hypertension, dyslipidemia, and these little guys down here are very important as we continue to talk about cardiovascular disease later on. So here's just some more data again to show. Look at the, the maps, the colors on them. You don't even have to look at numbers. So from 1995 all the way to 2015, look at the amount of red on these maps. So the, um, the epidemic of di uh, obesity and um, diabetes parallel each other as they continue to progress and increase throughout time. Just in, in this time period here, you can see how severe we've gotten. And we know about 90%, I'm just going to put 
of adults with type 2 diabetes were overweight or obese, okay? Um, and we can see uh, about almost 50% were the obese, 30 to 50, 40 BMI, and about 15% over 40. This is very, very remarkable. We know diabetes is increasing throughout the world, significant increases throughout every country. In the United States, we can see this increase as well with um, diabetes significantly going up over time. We don't have to look at the specific numbers. We just look at the graph and we know that. And we can look, break it down by, by um, ethnic group. And there are some significant differences between different ethnic groups. And we know that this is either socioeconomic um, or um, genetic. So there's a, a various different things that come into play here. And if we look at age, right? So this is what really bugs me, um, is these adolescents, the significant increase in every ethnic group in type 2 diabetes in even this 10 to 19 year old age group, which is very, very alarming. So I told you I'm going to fix the California myth. You know, we thought what we were yellow out west, but and we think that we're, you know, outdoors people. We go out camping. We like to run and frolic on the beach. Um, you know, we're Hollywood people and we eat our avocados, right? Well, they did a nice um, study here at UCLA a few years ago. And look at that. About 46% of the state is pre-diabetic. And so that's quite alarming, right? And 9%, which is lower than national averages, 9% is uh, diabetic. But if we look at that 46% that is going to be moving into diabetes over the next 5, 10 years, this is very, very alarming. So we add on our next member of the unholy trinity, cardiovascular disease. Obesity and diabetes along with hypertension and dyslipidemia. I often, this middle globule here, I like to affectionately call a three-legged stool to my, um, uh, my patients. And any one of those rungs, if they're not standing upright, um, you're going to fall over, right? So every time we talk about diabetes in my clinic with patients, we're also talking about their blood pressure and also talking about their lipids. So we cannot talk about diabetes without these other two. And often this will lead to cardiovascular disease. So we can go all the way back to the Framingham study and look at the significant increase in um, cardiovascular risk with diabetes in both men and women. And then um, in, in 1998, excuse me, this Hafner study. So this is one of the major studies that actually showed that diabetes was a cardiovascular equivalent. We look up here that um, uh, survival was uh, about the same as a patient with a diabetic that had no prior MI as a patient that was non-diabetic that had an MI. So survival is about the same um, in terms of cardiovascular disease. So that's why we have diabetes as a cardiovascular risk equivalent. And just more data showing cardiovascular disease and mortality associated with diabetes. If we look here um, with um, CHD mortality, CVD mortality, um, so cardiovascular, a little bit higher than diabetes as far as if you've had a prior history, but they are definitely additive to each other. If you add CVD and diabetes together, even more significant increased risk of death and poor outcomes. And when we look at diabetes, the number one cause of hospitalizations is major cardiovascular disease. So we know that this is something that definitely um, is, is a huge part of why patients are dying and why we have such high morbidity and mortality in our diabetic patients. And we know that the cost of diabetes, so all of that and, and on top of it, the, the resources that we were using, and last time they looked at this in 2017 was $327 billion. So if we could fix one disorder, you know, focus a lot of money towards it, I think it should be diabetes. I might be biased because I'm an endocrinologist, but I think a lot of that money should go into fixing diabetes, right? So if we go back to Mr. H, we know he's obese. We know he has CAD now. He has dyslipidemia and he has uncontrolled diabetes. If we look at what his average blood sugars would be on our chart of A1C, so he's running above 200 most times based on his A1C we said was about 9.8. So when we put these two, these three, excuse me, the unholy trinity together, there's many times where I've kind of wondered, you know, well, I try to be a medication minimalist. I tell my patients that I really do. I try not to add things on, but I, you know, many times patients want things that are easy. They want things that they can take one pill, one medicine, one thing, and fix all, everything. Now, that's not always the case, but one of the things I'd like to show you guys today are some ways that maybe we can target all three with maybe one therapy at a time, okay? I want to show a little video here. I don't know, is the volume up? Um, or is it up? Let me just make sure I don't blow people's eardrums to kingdom come here. We can try to... Okay, all right. So a 
couple years ago, I was watching the Winter Olympics, and I personally, I kind of heard of it, but I've never seen this sport called curling. Has anybody else seen this sport? Okay. Pro and now let me, who's from the north of America? Okay. <laughs> so mainly a Canadian and Northern America, uh, part of the U.S. kind of thing. But they throw these stones, right? And you're supposed to throw them right towards the center and get it right on the spot. And it was amazing to me that, and then in between that, these people with brooms and this, this person here that's throwing the stone is yelling at those people at the same time to make sure that they sweep it the right way. So sometimes I feel I'm kind of this person here. I want one therapy to get right where I want it to be. And sometimes there's some weeping and gnashing of teeth here, um, trying to get uh, patients to, to do what I need well, I them to do. But just watch how or amazing or this or is. Or uh, backing, like okay. if, if, if you uh, end up behind the T-line, just gives uh, Val an easier shot. Okay. And there's not much behind the difference between on the pin and behind the T-line. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, a lot of yelling. Lot of, please take your medication. Please take your medication. I promise it's going to get you there. I promise. <laughs> They're going right for that pin. Here they come. Here they come. Officer McEwen. Here they come. Here it comes. Bam. Not bad, right? Wow. Not too shabby at all. So this is what we're trying to get for our patients. We're trying to get a targeted therapy and, you know, make it easy and simple for patients. So if you look at this, simplicity, right? This is the ADA most recent guideline. Um, so for patients, not so simple, but we're gonna break it down to see how we can, we can help out here. I may need you to turn up just a little bit on the next one, if you want mine. So the first thing we have is comprehensive lifestyle um, management. So it was a great talk that Dr. Sandu and Dr. Yu just gave. Um, one of the baselines and the foundations of diabetes care, I don't care who you are, is really lifestyle management. Um, I tell my patients again that if I, I can do everything I can by giving you certain medications, if you don't change your lifestyle, none, nothing that I give you is ever going to work. Um, so we really need to target that. So let's take a look at you know treatment for on a holy trinity with lifestyle medication. So when we talk about treatment for pre-diabetes here, we can see very clearly that lifestyle was better than metformin and placebo for decreasing your, your incidence of diabetes later on. So the folks that actually were in a lifestyle preventive um, program, they did much better than metformin or placebo, right? So we know that they actually had less incidence of developing diabetes later on. And one of the reasons why we have developed a diabetes prevention program here at Loma Linda. In that same data, they actually looked at your change in weight, right? So those people who act were in the very structured lifestyle component did better than placebo or metformin um, years down the road, right? So down the road, you can see they might have came up a little bit, but they still lost significantly more amount of weight than the other um, arms of that study. And this is part of the look ahead study. This is one of the major studies looking at um, lifestyle management in diabetes. And we can see it definitely lowers weight when you have a um, structured lifestyle program. It definitely has a significant change in your hemoglobin A1C. It definitely allows you to lower the use of hypertension medications, which you remember that was added onto that second little unholy trinity mark. And then it also changes your ability for needing cholesterol medications, okay? So we do know that lifestyle has a very positive effect on many factors that affect diabetes and later cardiovascular disease. So this was shown, um, it, again, in the look ahead, just looking at our graph here. So if we look at our control group versus our intervention group, um, they definitely had a decrease in weight that they maintained years down the road um, by entering um, a lifestyle program. The only major issue, and we haven't been able to show this, is that there's been no actual difference in CV outcomes, meaning mortality or difference in coronary vascular disease later on in life. So although we haven't been able to prove that, we do know that by, we can modify a lot of the factors that affect um, cardiovascular disease. We also know that in diabetics, if we just tell them to walk, so with, we were talking earlier um, in the last lecture about you know, just having meeting patients where they are. I have a lot of patients that they can't go to the gym, they can't afford it, or they have many other comorbidities that they can't do those types of exercise. So I tell them just to go walk. And we know that walking will actually decrease mortality in many of those patients. So I, what I tell them, well, they say, well, I'm a little bit scared. My neighborhood's not so good. I said, just walk around in circles in your house if you have to, right? That's uh, uh, whatever you need to do to get out and get some activity. We know that that's gonna be beneficial later on. So I like to preach that we have a diabetes treatment center here at Loma Linda. Um, they do a lot of good work. We have really good educators and they preach and teach this stuff day in, day out. And again, this is the foundation 
of lifestyle change. Um, when we talked about diet, one specific diet for patients um, with Dr. Sandu and Dr. Yu, very similar to uh, diabetics. Um, I, this morning, I was trying to bargain with a patient who I've seen three times now in helping him to get off just soda. I said, we're gonna pick one thing, we're gonna try to get you that, off of that in a year. And so I'm, every time he comes in, I sometimes try new drinks just for this guy because I'm trying to figure out something that will taste good that has very low sugar in it just so that he will actually implement it. So I've, tried to give it, I've given him all kinds of different things. He doesn't like anything I've given him. He said, oh, I found something. It's Gatorade. I said, Gatorade has too much sugar in it. <laughs> you can't drink that either. So I had too much salt, right? And so uh, I usually start off with a patient. When I first see them, I say, pick one thing. What's your one thing? Because there's a majority of time, that makes a huge difference. There's been many times where it is that soda. It's uh, two two-liter bottles um, that, are, uh, that I've seen that are people are just you know, drinking daily. And that makes a huge difference if you can cut that out of your life, absolutely. So moving away from lifestyle, the next thing that they say at the very top of our, uh, our, our, our algorithm here is metformin. So how many people in this room have used metformin for one of their patients? Okay, tried and true, right? We all trust metformin. It's a great medication. So let's see, does that meet that kind of in the middle in that unholy trinity? Can it treat all the three things here? Well, from, we did, a, a, well, not us, but a meta-analysis here um, in the Annals of Family Medicine, actually, and it did show that there, overall, there is a significant decrease in weight, modest, but there is a decrease in weight with using metformin. And so a lot of people don't realize that metformin can be used as a modest weight loss medication. It's not, you know, um, hugely significant, and many times patients don't notice a lot, but again, it's going in the right direction there, okay? So we can use metformin for that, and at least it's weight neutral, if nothing else. The problem is it has not been shown to have any decrease in cardiovascular risk. So um, with several different studies, as you can see here, um, most of them have not been able to show any significant decrease in death or mortality from cardiovascular causes over time. Um, they have done a study a couple years ago in type 1 diabetics that they were able to show that there was a decrease in the carotid intima thickness of type 1 diabetics. Um, that's supposed to be a, a surrogate marker for cor uh, coronary artery disease. However, uh, it was just barely significant. So, and that's for use in type 1 diabetic. So it's still not completely clear. So for metformin, not really meeting that center rung there for our unholy trinity. All right, so moving on to other treatment options. So a, a few years ago, um, the ADA did something that was a little bit different. They actually said, rather than, if you look at that big chart in that algorithm, they just kind of spewed out like vomitous, okay, after metformin, use this, and it was every other medication. Um, a few years ago, they said, well, if you have um, high-risk um, disease or uh, high-risk features that may be associated with cardiovascular disease, maybe you should consider other medications because we have some good data now that show this may be beneficial for patients. So that was the first time they did that. I was kind of mind-blowing for many people to say, now that we have a little bit more structure um, for where we go next with our patients after lifestyle and metformin. So let's talk a little bit about other options here. Let's see, I might, how do I turn up the sound? Because this one I need a little bit higher here. Is it uh, F2? So I'll just show you a little video here. Um, one of the issues, again, I try to be a medication minimalist, but if a patient needs a medication, I feel it's going to um, help and decrease you know, some other risk. I, I feel like we should um, move forward with that medication. However, I'm sometimes met with a little bit of resistance because of things that you hear on the TV. I'm sure you've all heard those, those um, commercials, right? Um, so you're, again, you're frolicking through a field of poppies because now you're gonna fix your diabetes, but at the end you're gonna die, you know, because of all the risk factors. So um, Jeff Fox really kind of shows you a little bit of that too. There's so many medicines, they got this prescription stuff that they advertise on TV, and I swear half the time the side effects are 50 times worse than what the medicine cures. <laughs> Like try new flora floor for itchy watery eyes, it's flora floor. Side effects may include nausea, vomiting, water weight gain, lower back pain, receding hairline, eczema, seborrhea, psoriasis, itching, chafing clothing, liver spots, blood clots, ringworm, excessive body odor, uneven tire wear, pyorrhea, gonorrhea, diarrhea, halitosis, scoliosis, loss of bladder control, hammer toe, the shanks, low sperm count, warp floors, cluttered drawers, hunchback, heart attack, low resale value on your home. 
Feline leukemia, athlete's foot, head lice, club foot, MSMD, VD, fleas, anxiety, sleeplessness, drowsiness, poor gas mileage, tooth decay, parvo, warts, unibrow, lazy eye, fruit flies, chest pains, clogged drains, hemorrhoids, dry heaving, and sexual dysfunction. <laughs> so sometimes when I see a patient, they'll come and say, I can't take that medication. I heard on TV, it's going to cause this, right? So um, many times we're, we're bargaining on uh, and, and discussing some of these risk factors. So we'll go over some of this today because I think that that's one of the barriers actually to using these medications is many of um, the community um, folks feel you know a little bit concerned on how to use these medications because of some of the specified um, side effects and risks that have been out there and may not be um, exactly stated correctly. So we'll just first talk about SGLT2 inhibitors, and you can see the list of the medications there. Just a reminder for us, how do SGLT inhibitors work? So if we have the lumen of the proximal tubule here, down in the nephron, we have our cells and we have our blood. So we have our normal sodium glucose-like transporter that takes up glucose along with sodium. This gets transported back into the blood through our GLUT2 um, channels here and uh, uh, we move sodium out as well through a sodium potassium pump. Well, SGLT2 works right here, and then we block that uptake of glucose into the blood, and so we end up, of course, with more um, glucose in the urine. So we overcome that threshold that we normally have, which is about 150, um, where we would uh, then increase that um, and end up with more um, glucose in the urine. So what are some benefits of SGLT2 inhibitors? Um, about um, uh, 0.5 to 0.7 reduction of A1C, although I will tell you anecdotally in my clinic, I do see patients that do much better than this. Uh, it actually causes a, or helps with blood pressure as well, one of the factors that we're trying to help with our patients. Um, and it also will decrease weight. So um, it decreases up to 10 pounds, averaging around four to six pounds. And I'll tell you what, I will take that every day, all day, if I have a medication for a patient that I need and it's gonna decrease weight, and I, I would say that that's significant. I've seen patients lose more weight than that. I've seen patients that lo have lost no weight with that, but again, some of that has to do with lifestyle as well. And then by itself, if you were just to use it by yourself, it has a low incidence of hypoglycemia. So let's talk a little bit, dive a little bit more, and we talked about weight loss. How about cardiovascular risk reduction? Well, this was one of the major landmark studies called the IMPA-REG study, or the impa -Gliflozin. And it showed, and I, there's a lot of data up here, but I just want to point out one, the number needed to treat. So it was for, um, it was for to treat three years, the number needed to treat was 38. So this is a significant decrease in cardiovascular risk reduction, okay? And we can show you their graphs here where their primary outcomes was significantly decreased. And I want you to just note right here, that curve starts to decrease right about three months. And that, that's important, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then we see death from cardiovascular causes, again, about three months, that curve significantly stretches out there. And this is a significant decrease in cardiovascular um, death with um, impagliflozin. Canagliflozin shows very similar, reduces cardiovascular events by 14%, also decreases the rate of renal decline by 40%, although there was some concern for lower limb amputation. So, Let's just um, look at here with the canvas study that shows a decrease in cardiovascular death, but again, there was a concern for amputations. So the way I handle this with my patients, if I do have a patient that is high risk for limb amputation, I don't use um, these medications, um, specifically this medication, um, canagliflozin, because of this data that's out there. So this is about a, a two-time increased risk of amputation, which we're not completely sure why it happens but it does seem to be um, perpetuated on other studies. So what are some limitations? And here's the risk, you know, like Jeff Foxworthy was telling us. So I will tell you the major things that I deal with in my clinic on these patients are the candidiasis, so um, vulvovaginal vaginal candidiasis, especially in women, and UTI. Um, so UTI, about 2% a risk over placebo, and I would tell you the next thing that I deal with is cost. So I have many patients that I felt that this is a great medication, absolutely, it will help decrease your cardiovascular risk, maybe you have heart failure as well, uh, but they just can't afford it. So I have some patients, um, they didn't hear it from me, they get it in Canada, okay? So um, um, they do go to that route if they need to, and we've um, established that they, they do have um, a benefit from it. Uh, modest, modest efficacy when it comes to A1C reduction. Um, and then euglycemic DKA. So this was put out by the FDA um, with about a year after these medications came out. So the SGLT2 inhibitors do increase glucagon. Glucagon 
it's theorized because of this may be the reason why there's an increased risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. And this is not the typical type one whose blood sugar is three, 400, 500. They come in with all the DKA symptoms. This is somebody that comes in with um, blood sugars around 180, 190, and they have nausea, vomiting, and they get passed off from ER to ER and with nausea, vomiting, because they couldn't have DKA with a blood sugar of 180. So I've seen about three of these patients here at Loma Linda who we were pretty certain that their initiation of the medication several months before was a reason for their DKA and multiple episodes of DKA, actually. Then we have another study here with the other medication that class uh, dapagliflozin, which um, again, this is able to show no major difference in cardiovascular events. So if we're not completely certain, is this all a class effect or is it only certain medications that are able to do this? Um, but the one difference in this study, uh, unlike other studies, was that this um, study had, uh, or other studies had lower baseline pop proportion of ba uh, patients with ASCVD. Um, so that could have been one of the significant confounders of this um, study. So moving on to GLP-1 analogs, I put my friend up here, the Gila monster, because this is actually a very smart man, developed the GLP-1s by looking at the venom of the Gila monster. So I think that's always cool to remember, and I always like to show my students and residents that. Um, the first one was Bieta here, or Exenatide, uh, a short release. Um, and it had a, quite a bit of GI side effect. Um, it was twice daily dosing. Um, I only really, over time, have had about two patients on this medication, just because the GI side effects were fairly significant, and many were unable to do the two times a day dosing. Since then, we have uh, Liraglutide, which is a daily dose. Um, you can see it that's marketed as uh, brand Victoza or brand Saxenda. And that's because Saxenda can be um, used by patients as a weight loss medication alone. So we'll talk about this. But Victoza, as a diabetes medication, goes up to 1.8 milligrams, while Saxenda goes up to 3 milligrams. So they, of course, entered a new patent so they could sell this and um, get more money later on. But you didn't hear that from me. Um, the next medications we have are some weekly ones, Exenatide, extended release. Dilaglutide, also extended release, it's a weekly version. So these are just once a week, which have made a huge difference in the compliance of my patients. Ozempic um, is another weekly one, and then Lixizenatide, um, which came out two years ago, is another short acting. This one has not got onto the market very much as far as market share. The other ones, Liraglutide, uh, Dilaglutide, and um, Semaglutide have been the ones with the highest market share and have been used. Semaglutide actually came out um, last year, at the end of last year, they were FDA approved for their oral version of this GLP-1. So that's the first oral GLP-1 we have, so it's a daily pill. And again, this may change um, uh, uh, how we practice because there may be sometimes we would like to use this medication, but a patient would, uh, doesn't want to do an injection, so we could go to the oral form of this. So you can see with benefit, the A1C reduction is better with GLP-1 analogs, 1 to 1.6% as opposed to the SGLT2s. They were not quite that good. Again, by themselves, they have low risk of hypoglycemia. And what's great about these guys is they decrease your daily insulin requirements. What I've done with these medications, I've learned. I had to learn sometimes the hard way. Um, I automatically, if a patient's on insulin, I automatically lower um, my patient's um, insulin by about 20, 25% because I know um, it's very predictable. About two weeks later, I will get a phone call if I don't and say, doctor, my blood sugars are going low. What do I do? So I don't even wait for that anymore. I lower their insulin right off the bat. If they're on a um, sulfonuria, I try to get them off of that as much as possible. And here's the kicker, weight loss, right? So the average with this, it's a little bit better, four to nine pounds. So that's the average. If we go up to the three milligram dose, which I was telling you, that's the um, excuse me, the um, liraglutide saxenda version, you can get a mean weight loss of 56 weeks in this study up to 18 pounds versus five pounds with just placebo. And when they actually tested against Orlistat, 15.8 pounds versus nine pounds. So very significant weight loss. And what's great about all of the GLP-1s, and it's been measured, if you look at all the different GLP-1s that are on the market, all of them have significant weight loss associated with them. So you, if uh, insurance doesn't cover one, you feel fairly confident about using one of the other brands because you know that they're gonna have some weight loss effect for patients. So we can see definitely we, we're meeting that um, um, need for our patients here in our unholy trinity. What, what about um, cardiovascular risk? So once again, um, there was a, a study that was done uh, about four years ago now. It was called the LEADER trial with liraglutide. 
And again, a lot of different data up here, but again, number needed to treat, not as good, not as good as the empagliflozin. So this one was nine, number needed to treat over three years was 98, okay? So not quite as good, but definitely significant. If we look at the curves for here, for the primary outcomes, you don't start to see the significant decrease or changing of the curves till about 18 months. So that's different than the other class of medications we were just talking about, which was three months. So that's important because if you have a patient that has a very high risk, maybe they just got out of the hospital and you want to really lower that cardiovascular risk right away, maybe the SGLT2 inhibitors are a better choice for your, your patient rather than the GLP-1. Maybe you add this one on later on. And you can see death from just cardiovascular cause. Once again, we're seeing that curve right around 18 months start to split, and this was definitely significant. And just looking at some of the other medications in this class, so semaglutide, again, primary outcome, did show a protective effect. Um, and then rates of death from cardiovascular causes were similar. So they didn't show an actual decrease in mortality, but they did show a decrease in the actual risk of developing those cardiovascular um, outcomes. So again, just to look at the curves, just to show you and to prove that yes, I am telling you the truth. <laughs> but again, the death from cardiovascular causes did not reach significant, uh, statistical significant. So no change in cardiovascular mortality. And they proved it with their oral. So they just wanted to make sure, yes, that the oral actually did show some of the same um, uh, things, although they were not able to show completely superiority of the oral semaglutide. So at this time, I continue to use the subcutaneous version of it just because I feel it's absorbed better um, than the oral medication. And I know that from the studies that we have, at least for now, that I'm giving the patient the best cardiovascular risk reduction I have. If I'm going to use these medications, I'm going to use the best choice that I have. So what are some limitations with using these class of medications? Um, one of the things, the black box warning, I tell my residents and students, this is going to be on your boards, right? Because that's what they're going to ask. So um, when they were doing studies with rats initially in their phase one and two studies, they did notice increase of C-cell hyperplasia. And that's why we do not use this in, um, um, in anybody that has a personal history or family history of medullary thyroid carcinoma. So we should not use it in patients with gastroparesis. Um, this will cause significantly decrease in gastric motility and will make it worse, um, and I've seen it. It actually has uncovered gastroparesis in some people where it was maybe mild and it got significantly worse. The GI side effects are the kicker here though. That's, I mean, in every single patient, um, this is what we tell them that this is gonna be what they're gonna be fighting against. Some people do quite well, some people don't do quite as well. Actually, not that I want them to experience nausea, definitely not vomiting, but I, I would like them to have just a little bit of that uh, because that's a satiation effect, right? And that's how the medication works. Decreased gastric motility works on the hypothalamus to say, hey, you're hungry, stop eating, okay? Um, and then the pancreatitis. So um, again, this has been a concern of many of my patients. Um, there's been studies, there's been position pa um, papers and uh, statements that have been issued that basically say, there's not enough data to show a significant uh, correlation with these medications and um, uh, increased risk of pancreatitis. The problem is that when there have been some small association, it's actually been with hemorrhagic pancreatitis, which is more severe um, when it does develop. But so far, I tell my patients you know, exactly what's in the literature, and I let them make the decision. But these medications have been game changers for many of my patients. I've seen A1Cs drop from 14 to seven in three months. I've seen people lose 50 pounds. I had one little older lady that needed a hip, um, uh, uh, um, a hip replacement, and she said, whatever you do, I'm gonna listen to it. So she did all the lifestyle stuff. She needed to lose 100 pounds. She lost 100 pounds in 12 months uh, on this medication, and of course, with her lifestyle changes. So these medications do work. I will tell you, that they just, again, anecdotally, by experience, they work very little if you do not put any activity at all. So if a patient just takes the medication and they maybe adjust their diet a little bit, but they don't do any activity, the weight loss is gonna be significantly lower in, in my experience than if they were to actually just go for a walk, like I was saying before. So if we look at our unholy trinity here and we kind of look at um, our medications, we know we have empagliflozin that meets right there in the middle for us, a little bit more to the cardiovascular side than towards the obesity, but definitely works for us there in the middle. We have canagliflozin meets us there as well. We have liraglutide, nice in the middle, maybe more towards the obesity side than the cardiovascular side, but I think that we can put that one right straight in the middle there. Semaglutide, again, right there in the middle, and dilaglutide also there. So, 
we know that we can use these medications and they're going to treat all three of those things for our patients and do it fairly well. So these have been game changer medications. So I'm going to just spend a little bit of time on how do they do that? How in the world do these medications actually do the changes um, that we're seeing in the studies? Because we're not sure. So is it with just hyperglycemic reduction? I will tell you very unlikely that it's just due to this, right? We have many different studies, Accord, Advance, VADT, um, UKPDS, long-term studies that have been unable to show that with intensive control of diabetes and getting that A1C low, 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 that it has not been shown to change your cardiovascular outcomes. So I don't think that these medications are working just by lowering glycemic index and, and, and hyperglycemia. So there has to be other reasons. So what about um, SGLT2 inhibitors? So again, that cardiovascular uh, benefit showed right after three months. So there's been a lot of different theories. You can see a lot of different studies here uh, down on the side. I will tell you, nobody knows. That's a take home message. But let's hypothesize just for a minute. So we think it's maybe due to a, a slowing of atherosclerotic process. Maybe it's a little bit of afterload reduction. Maybe it's a little bit of preload reduction. There's been hypothesis on decrease in arterial stiffness. A couple that I really like is that there may be a direct effect on myocytes. So the, um, we know that SGLT2 inhibitors um, may also weakly affect um, SGLT1 on myocytes. So there may be an inhibitory effect that actually allows the myocytes or gives some myocyte protection there. Um, again, this is a hypothesis that has not been proven. Then there's a glucagon effect. To me, glucagon's a bad guy. I don't like glucagon too much most of the time because as my, I have a lot of type one diabetics. The higher the glucagon, we know uh, majority of the time that's gonna throw them into DKA, okay? Um, of course, glucagon can save their life too if they have to inject it from a hypoglycemic episode. Um, but glucagon, SGLTs increase glucagon like we were saying before, and glucagon has been shown to be an uh, inotropic agent as well as a vasodilator. So the thought is, well, maybe it's this increase in glucagon that's causing the beneficial effect on heart health, which is interesting because the GLP-1s directly lower glucagon, and so they're fighting against each other, so it's really not clear here. So let's look at GLP-1s. They don't get to see their benefits until 18 months later, so why are they doing it? Well, maybe it's a decrease just in the natural history and progression of diabetes. You lose more weight with these types of medications, so you lower your blood pressure, lower your lipids, so just basic process of atherosclerotic disease um, uh, risk reduction. Maybe it's calorie restriction, maybe it's some anti-inflammatory effect from calorie restriction like the last um, uh, talk was talking about. Or this is another very interesting hypothesis, a direct action on the cardiovascular system, whether it's uh, um, increased in nitro oxid, uh, oxide production, um, if a decrease in plaque formation, or a change in autonomic nervous balance. It's not completely clear, but these are some of the ways that are being hypothesized that um, how these medications are doing it. So I'd be remiss if I didn't actually mention bariatric surgery quickly. We know that there's a few different types of bariatric surgery, and we know that all bariatric surgeries, the types will decrease or um, lower your incidence of diabetes in the future, um, which is one of the reasons why we do these surgeries is to lower that risk. And we know that gastric bypass actually lowers um, uh, your cardiovascular risk as well. You see the Ruin Y bypass here. The GRAS is much lower than the control group here in terms of patients that develop severe cardiovascular disease later on. And then we look here um, for our top here in cardiovascular disease, 56% of patients with um, CAD um, and then 92% uh, for patients with diabetes. So we do know that um, the bariatric surgery will lower risk of cardiovascular disease as well as we know definitely it's gonna lower weight. So once again, it meets that center aisle there for uh, unholy trinity. So we could um, have bariatric surgery in our little circle of, of trust there as well. So all else being said, we have several new classes of medications now that we know can target different things at different times obesity, cardiovascular disease, as well as glycemic control. So no more are the days of just using the sulfonuria um, or you know, medications that don't have any other um, risk benefit. When I'm treating my patients, I'm thinking, if I'm gonna use a medication on you, I wanna minimize side effects, so I wanna use the least amount of medications that I can. What kind of medications can I give you that won't just lower your blood sugar, but also have a risk reduction and other um, risk that you're gonna develop in the future? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Cordonis, for that 
tremendous lecture. It's question time, and I can see hands popping up. Do we have lots of hands? Where the microphone will start on this side. Hands again here. Thank you, Thank you for that lecture. The, you know, I I got a question on metformin. You know, the teaching on metformin was that we use it because it's a cheap medication and decreases mortality and morbidity, and so that's the go-to medication. So when I saw that study that metformin did not result in decreased heart attack, that kind of blew my mind. Mm -hmm. And then the second question is with ampagliflozin and, can, and canadoflozin, the canadoflozin showed a double risk of uh, amputation. Do they suspect that also may be a class effect as well? So maybe that may apply to ampagliflozin because I know these are relatively you know new medications, and sometimes with these new meds, you know you begin to find out things uh, years yeah. later down the line. Absolutely. So with metformin, so metformin is cheap. It has low side effect profile. And we do know that if we go look at that DPP data, right, the diabetes prevention program data, that we do decrease our incidence of developing diabetes in our pre-diabetes patients. We know that um, metformin will keep our mild diabetes patients under control very well. And so you're lowering the risk factors of all the other things that the UK PDS study and the complication rates show with the lowering of the A1C. Um, I think that's a good place to start because when, just like I tell my patients, when we're starting a new medication, we put things on the scale of life, and we want to look at which one weighs out with the benefit, which one weighs out with the risk. So some of these new medications, just like in your second question there, there are some side effects and risk of those medications, so we have to balance that as well. So if we're starting a patient with an A1C of uh, 7.1, and we're going straight to empagliflozin, that may not be the best thing for that patient unless they have, again, we're adding things to that the benefit that might give, because if they have heart failure already, their EF of 25% and they have severe coronary artery disease, that may be even a better choice for that patient than metformin. So remember, these ADA guidelines are just that guidelines. Um, as physicians, you know, we can make our own choices and sometimes it may be more beneficial to go around what's recommended first um, rather than going, you know, and using something we think might be a bit more beneficial for the patient, except for lifestyle. We never skip that step. Um, um, for the second question, so um, we don't know if it's a class effect. So I've, I've read different things from different folks. Some would say, I would never use an SGLT2 inhibitor for patients at really high risk for amputation. I just won't do it just because of um, the data from the Canvas study. And then I've heard some other people say, oh, it's not been shown in any of the other studies, it hasn't been replicated yet, so um, I'm still gonna use it. I'm kind of in the middle, and, and I'm not sure where I stand yet, to tell you the truth. I've had patients that um, they've had diabetic foot ulcers, and so what I do, if their insurance only covers canagliflozin, I will write a little letter at the bottom of my note and saying, do the Canvas study, this patient feels that this medication is risk for amputation is unacceptable, and we request um, empagliflozin. And sometimes insurance will actually go for that. Um, because they haven't been proven. So I don't know the answer to your question, but like you said, a lot of this stuff will ferret itself out over time. Next question to um, your right. Yeah. Yesterday we had a very good lecture by Dr. Longo about uh, periodic uh, fasting mimicking diet. And uh, for yeah, diabetics, sorry, we obviously have ADA diet, but I wonder if uh, you know something like that would be helpful for brittle diabetics or, you know, uh, folks who are more resistant to treatment. So did you say periodic what now? Peri oh, so I'll be um, perfectly open with you. Um, I am a big fan of intermittent fasting. I, I am an intermittent faster myself and there's different forms of intermittent fasting. Um, myself, I fast until 1 p.m. and then I don't eat after 7 p.m. So to me, that's what works best for me. Um, and I, I try to preach that to many, especially my type one patients, um, where their blood sugars are so variable. Um, I actually tell many of my patients with type one diabetes, I can get your A1C to 6.5, you'll probably never have any highs or lows, you could just never eat again. Because the majority of where their spikes and lows come from is from trying to administer insulin for food that they're eating. And much of it is not their fault. It's just we cannot replicate what the body does uh, when we're taking in carbohydrate. So I think intermittent fasting to move away, move some carbohydrates, some food away from one of the meals a day and leave a space open is actually quite beneficial. And we might decrease some of that variability in their blood sugar during that time, especially for folks that are on insulin pumps and some of the newer technology. So I am a big fan of intermittent fasting actually. And I think it works quite well for many of our diabetics. 
but they still got to eat well the other two meals. That's the problem. You can't go crazy and uh, just eat junk. <laughs> Next question here. Yes. Um, I'm an ER doc, and we don't usually start people on this kind of stuff. Um, and But we do run into people who are taking medicines, and uh, the medicines that I have been seeing until very recently, and uh, still very recently, is glipizide and gliburide. Have those gone the way of the dinosaur, or, or uh, what's uh, happening there? So the, the one of the major issues that we're fighting right now are just, and I, I mentioned that, is cost of medication. So there's many people that cannot afford these medications and they don't have resources to try to figure out how to go outside the country to get them. So it's, it pains me sometimes when I have to have patients on some of those medications because I know I only thing I'm doing is lowering their blood sugar, which is fine, but I'm also increasing risk of hypoglycemia with glipizide or gliburide. I would love to have them on another medication, but a lot of times it's cost. Or sometimes it's because a physician or primary care doctor is not familiar with some of these other medications. They're a little bit scared with the Jeff Boxworthy side effects, right? Um, and so that's why we're trying to educate and help um, uh, providers in, in, in primary care to be able to use these more often. But I think you're gonna still see glipizide gliburide no matter what, because those are, you can get a three month supply at Walmart for 10 bucks. Same thing with insulin. You can get a vial of 70-30 insulin over the counter, really. You don't have to have a prescription for 25 bucks at Walmart. Whereas if I give you Lantus or Humalog, it's gonna be $600 out the door if you paid out of pocket. Any other questions? Dr. Kodornis, thank you, thank you again thank you. for that awesome lecture.